introduce myself, Laura, I, I know I've met you before at your farm. My name is Dayton Maxwell and I am the farm business management educator with the CAP team. And yeah, Aaron, you wanna just introduce yourself? So I'm Aaron Gabriel with uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension and um, I'm the agronomy educator. And today I'll be talking about the pasture management end of things. Yeah. Great. Uh, and I'm Ashley Pierce and I'm the livestock educator. And today I'm gonna to talk about uh, like body condition score, winter feeding, that, that kind of good stuff. Okay. And I did, and I'm gonna talk about uh, vision and mission planning for your business. I didn't mention that, so, okay. Aaron, are you gonna, you, you gonna start us out? Yep, yeah, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay, does that look good? Yeah, looks good. Okay. So, you know, it's been quite a season, um, been long and dry and we're finally getting some rain. And just like, you know, when you're farming and, you know, September comes, the days get a little short. You want to kind of chill out and relax a little bit. And it's kind of the same thing for the pastures. You know, we're finally getting some rain at the end of the season and they need to grow and rest and kind of replenish themselves. So we want to, uh, the basic principle is you have all this pasture and you want to give it a good rest period, but going into the winter, when we're done grazing, we don't want a lot of aftermath. We want to graze it down to about four inches or so. And we'll explain why a little bit more as we go along. Another point I want to make is that uh, different grasses are sensitive to frost to different degrees. So in this upper left corner here, this is a clump of orchard grass. You can see that's all dead. This is, and this photo was taken in January, but you can see that grass is all dead. But some of the blue grass is still nice and green. And that's grazable. Here we have a little red clover plant in this upper right photo, and that's pretty sensitive to frost. The dino is not quite so sensitive. Our fescues are pretty tolerant tall fescue and meadow fescue, and this reed canary grass uh, that gets hammered, that's one of the first grasses to go with the frost. So I think reed canary grass is first, orchard grass is second, and then um, like blue grass and then our fescues. So basically you wanna graze those grasses before they get all dead. So the question is, uh, you know, to survive winter properly, uh, we need to have storage in our roots. We need to store up carbohydrates. So the question is, you know, what's in your rhizomes? Uh, here we have some bluegrass rhizomes and to store up carbohydrates, you just need that rest period. So our sod grasses with rhizomes, they store things uh, in the rhizomes, bunch grasses like uh, orchard grass, they store carbohydrates in the base of the stem. And that's why we don't want to graze them or mow them too close so we don't remove those. And this is Timothy. They have a kind of a swollen base of the stem called the culm. So we want those uh, filled with carbohydrates so that they can survive the winter because plants are still respiring at a very low rate through the winter. Uh, the same thing for legumes. Here's an alfalfa root. It got heaved out of the soil. So from, you can see the dry part of the stem here, that was actually above the soil line. And uh, alfalfa needs about six weeks of growth before it goes dormant. So really from about first of September, early September on, we don't wanna be harvesting or grazing it. The worst thing is to, you know, graze it or harvest it in like late September, October, and then it's going to regrow and it's going to use up this carbohydrate storage and that really hurts it. Tree foil, calling us the sensitive legume because it needs a little bit more of a rest period than alfalfa. This is a chicory and we want to think about our, our forbs, you know, dandelions, chicory, plantain, those are all very excellent pasture species and uh, most of them have a tap root or some sort of uh, plantain's got a fleshy root, kind of fleshy fibrous root system. 
they also need a rest period and need to store up carbohydrates. So if there's too much plant residue, this is a malting barley field. Uh, you can see if there's too much residue, uh, we can get what's called snow mold. And that's when you have a cover of snow in like March, and then you get some warm days. And underneath that snow, the foliage just rots away. And if the conditions persist, you'll rot out the crowns and the roots of your grasses. So we want to be careful for snow mold especially with perennial ryegrass that gets snow mold very easily. So this, this hay field here at my place is about a foot tall. Uh, it's been harvested since I took this picture. So it's been mowed down to about four inches and that's about what we want. The other thing is uh, late in the season here, there's, the days are short so we're not we're not making a lot of sugars in the plants but because the temperatures are cool there's not a lot of indigestible fiber either so the quality changes as we get into the fall so lots of people like to interseed clovers and legumes into their grasses and i did a little test here in my field from about mid-september on i mowed one section about four times and another section about three times, to try to stress it out. But it's kind of hard to do. I mean, this, this area that I mowed intensely just came up like the rest of the field. So when you have a healthy grass stand and, um, you know, if to stress it out, I think you'd have to mow it really, really close. And, uh, but sometimes that can be hard to do. Although we're coming out of a drought, so if your pastures have been grazed hard all year and they didn't get to grow well, uh, that's enough to stress them out. So for fall fertilization is important. Um, you have to be careful with the nitrogen because if you get a lot of lush growth, that makes plants susceptible to winter injury. Phosphorus is perfect for healthy growth and we have to develop our buds during this time of year. And so we need adequate phosphorus and potassium is important because that helps, that puts the carbohydrates where they belong. Uh, that nutrients moving up and down the phloem and xylem uh, is associated with potassium. And so we need that for uh, tucking things away for the winter. So that's very important to have adequate uh, potassium in the fall. So if you've been grazing your pastures hard all year and it's been droughty, this is kind of what the roots might look like. We want to think like a bear. We want to get fat and take a nap for the winter. So if you give your pasture a rest, we want something like this. We want to think like a bear. Other factors we talked about fertility and having a good root system to take up those nutrients in the spring. Uh, if the plants are going to get a good start, they have to be on the starting line and ready to go and have the food there to, to, to grow. We don't want weeds swooping in and stealing our nutrients at our family dinner table when food is uh, missing from your plate. It's because someone's swooping in with a little family joke there. And plant residue, not only can it foster snow mold, but if you have a lot of plant residue, it's like a cold blanket. and It's hard for the soil to warm up in the spring if you have an organic matter blanket covering everything. And, you know, some of us are morning people and some aren't. And some forages are early spring crops and some aren't. Okay, and so just by the species and variety, um, may or may not wake up early in the spring. And then our sod grasses, you know, the roots and the buds are buried in the soil and the soil is going to warm up faster or slower than uh, the surface. And for bunch grasses, those buds are at the soil surface so they can get that heat and start up a little bit earlier in the spring. I just want to mention the New York State Forage Exchange. If you're short on forage or have extra to sell, that's uh, one place you can do it. And that's a 
basics of uh, managing pasture in the fall so that in the spring you're off to a good start. Do I have any questions? I have a question, Aaron. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, controlling weeds um, in the fall by bush hogging? Is that a good strategy? Yeah, so you have to be persistent and I would say you have to start earlier than the fall. So like for milkweed, I would say from flowering on from, you know, mid August on if you can basically not let it replenish those roots, whether it be milkweed or thistle or uh, other, other, um, you know, weeds like that. So that when, means that means clipping often. Often starting for thistle, like when for burdocks, when would you start? So so well, so here burdock, uh, I know people aren't gonna want to hear this, but burdock is an okay pasture plant, all right? Because animals will eat it. The funny thing is it seems like they don't really eat it until it, it gets tall, which is a biennial. So the first year the leaves are all a rosette and it's making a big fat root going right through clay. So it's actually loosening up the soil. Year two, it sends up its seed stalk and that's when it seems like animals eat it the most, they'll strip the leaves off. So all you need to do is mow it once, once it flowers, but before it sets seed and you should, uh, you'll take care of it because it's not gonna come back after that. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right. The, um... All right, I think I am up next. Let me get my PowerPoint ready here. Okay, so yeah, as I said, I'm Ashley Pearson. I am the livestock educator for the CAP team. And um, I, you know, feel free to type in questions or unmute yourself and, uh, you know, interrupt me at any point. Um, also, I have some good handouts that I'd be happy to um, have emailed to you. I, I make myself a note actually to have Tove do that. Um, yeah, all right, so let's get going. So I'm gonna talk a little about uh, body condition scoring on cattle and small ruminants and uh, reasons why it's important to maintain that good body condition through the winter. And then just winter feeding, bunk space, all that kind of good stuff. And I have a picture of a nice, happy, fat sheep here with her lamb. Um, let's move my screen around. Okay, so. so excuse me, Ashley, we're seeing the, the presenter view rather than the attendee view. Oh, okay. So we can see your little sidebar on the right. How is that, Aaron? That's better. Okay, great. So what are our goals? So I want to try to maintain weight on animals through the winter and hopefully gain weight as well on the animals that we're trying to finish. Um, one thing, I don't have specific slides on this. I, I had a hard time finding actual studies on it, but they talk a lot about finishing animals. And if you are to go backwards through the winter and start losing condition, um, even if, so if I have that intramuscular fat, and I'm losing it, even if I get it back in warmer weather or you know, whatever time I, I start to get that fat back, I've still really diminished my meat quality. So on all of our types of animals, all classes of animals, maintaining and gaining are gonna be really important. And it is definitely challenging through the winter. Um, also more maybe for our small ruminant people that are gonna be lambing, kidding in the winter and early spring. And I know I'll, our beef producers might be calving at different times, but 95% of that fetal growth is happening in the last trimester, which especially for our small ruminants is gonna be in the colder months. So it's really important that we keep those mothers healthy. And I'm gonna show you some slides too uh, that talk about mother and offspring health really being very affected by uh, body condition, whether good or bad. Uh, so with cattle, this, you know, again, don't, I don't want you to have to feel like you need to read this uh, whole thing, but there's a lot 
Oh, move this. So there's some uh, key places that we're going to be looking at when we're evaluating body condition score. So ribs, their backbone, uh, this transverse process, hooks, tail head, pins, shoulder, brisket. Uh, and again, I have a great body condition score handout that I'll provide you guys. Uh, Tove will email that out. But these are some of the key places we're going to be looking at body condition. And what we really want, it, you know, it's going to vary slightly depending on the stage of life for the cow, uh, you know, um, you know, what we're asking her to do. Uh, but in, typically, we're going to want from like five to seven. And I'll get into what uh, we want for each animal. But uh, again, I know in a presentation like this, it's hard to like see each animal. So this will be in the handouts. But again, we're looking at those key points that I just mentioned in the slide prior. So uh, backbone, you know, hooks, tail head, pins. And you can see in these different animals, <clears throat> you know, how they'll either be more fleshy or not. So in the like body condition four, uh, from the hooks to the pins, you know, it, we might see a V there where really we want to see more like a U. So there's there's some key points there that we want to be looking at. The, the challenge now in this kind of weather is I know like at home I have some calves and they're really getting furry and it's a little harder to see. But, uh, you know, as much as you can, keeping an eye on that and seeing, you know, trying to evaluate. And again, it's, it's really about consistency as well. So maybe my evaluation runs towards, uh, you know, being a little heavier, a little thinner. You know, as long as I'm really consistent with my evaluation, that's going to be important. And um, the more you do it, just getting an eye for it. You know, the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. Um, cattle run on a one to nine point scale. And as you'll see in a minute here, sheep and goats run on a one to five. So they're slightly different, but we're gonna be looking at the same key areas. So again, don't feel like, you know, don't try to read all this, I can send it out to you, but they're gonna go through each of these. And these are gonna be things you're gonna want to be looking at when you're, uh, you know, deciding what body condition. Uh, oh, uh, Chrissy, I see you have a raised hand. What question can I answer for you? I had a quick question. So we're yeah. a commercial black Angus operation and we have a uh, 150 pairs that we're getting ready in winter, getting ready for winter with and such. And we cap from May to July. Um, okay. And I wondered, I always, I'm the one down cutting strings with the cattle and my husband's in his, tra in his tractor. Yeah. And I'm always really critical of how the cows look and their condition and such but I'm not always sure the optimum time to judge that. So we feed right now, we do baleage mm -hmm. and then we switch to dry hay when the weather gets really bad, but we don't feed every day. We have feeders that we can be able to provide what they should need for two days and such. So I always, when, I'm not sure exactly when is the best time to judge that. It should be like 12 hours after you fed, right? Uh, so, and I do talk about rumen fill a little in here too. So the rumen fill maybe could okay. could help like be maybe deceiving in some ways because they look really full. But that's why if we go back, some of these other points will be really important too. So for looking, you know, at tailhead, um, and I'll I have a really great I think it's University of Kansas Extension publication that will go through all of these points that I'd love to send you to. But hopefully these other things won't change. So like, and I keep kind of pointing at my screen, so I might look kind of funny in the video here, but. Um, you know, if we're looking at like the point from the hooks to the pins, again, like on a thin animal, when I'm thinking of a dairy animal, you know, that's more like a V, where on a fleshier animal, that'll be more like a U, uh, you know, that fat on the tail head, uh, the brisket fill. So some of those things, even if they're fed, they're, those things won't change. So we'll try to look at those areas that can be more consistent. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for interrupting too. I, I know um, I, I like to ask questions in the, mo in the moment. So I appreciate you, you doing that. Um, and then also when to take them, I think, too, this might lead into your question a little bit as well, because, you know, if you're heard, like you said, they're um, calving from May to July, that's a relatively, like, it's not a huge spread, but they're, you know, some are going to be calving months ahead of others. And so having, again, that kind of consistent time frame that you're looking at them or knowing uh, pretty much when, what, at what point you want to see what kind of condition. So here uh, at weaning, so if I'm going to we in 60 days prior to, to calving say, I wanna see my cow at a five to six body condition score. And 
I want to see my heifers a little heavier than the cows, ideally, because they're still they're still going to be needing energy to put to growth as well. So 90 days before calving, I want to see a first calf heifer. Um, so prior to calving, six out of six to seven. And otherwise, again, she may have a hard time keeping on enough condition to rebreed in your window. So if you have a larger window, it's not as big of a deal. Uh, but you know, if you're trying to get them bred in a, a shorter time frame having that higher condition could be really helpful. A mature cow is a body condition of five to six. Um, at calving, <clears throat> that first calf heifer again, uh, having her calve at a six to seven body condition score could be good. And again, she's gonna be needing to put a lot of energy into milking, feeding that calf, recovering from the birth as well as then uh, growing. Uh, so that's why the mature cow can be a little thinner at five to six and then breeding again, the same, the same scores for the same reasons. All right, so, and then I just wanted to briefly talk about sheep and goats. I know they're not as common maybe with our producers, but um, they're a little tougher, at least the sheep, because you really have to put your hands on them to get a good idea. Uh, I hear that a lot. I feel like in the spring when people are shearing their animals, they're like, oh, I had no idea they were so thin. And so that, you know, if possible, if you can get your hands on them, that's going to be really helpful to you. Again, they have a, a shorter, uh, or I guess more condensed kind of scoring system, one to five instead of one to nine. But you can always, you know, when we were scoring dairy cattle, you know, we'd say maybe, oh, she's, you know, 3.25. So you could always break it down in this too, if you're doing that on your farm, as long as you're consistent. So again, uh, this would be the same for goats, but with a goat, in most cases, it's going to be easier because you, you can see, you can be more visual than you can with a sheep. But um, a lot of the the sheep stuff is really based on feeling them. So if you can get them in a, a shoot or some kind of situation where you can handle them, you're gonna have a lot better uh, luck with the sheep. Sorry. There we go, okay. So again, um, a lot of reading, but I'll send out some good stuff on scoring sheep and goats as well, like handouts that you could, you could reference. Um, and I'm trying to think there's some good hand, uh, let me think of how my friend does it. Like he'll use, his, one of the educators will use his hand as a reference guide. So pretty much like your knuckles here were a three. And I forget how he did, I shouldn't even say, cause I can't remember how he did four and five, but pretty much like if you're feeling your knuckles across the top here, that would be a three. These would be a four, your fingers here. And then like, if you were to feel these ridges that would be a five and then, um, just to kind of give you a reference guide to, to what you would be feeling for with these. Um, oh, you know what it was, let me actually go back. Like if you were to, um, to give you a reference again, a one would be like your forearm. If you were to feel that sheep, you know, you kind of feel the fat. Uh, a two is like your wrist. You feel like a little bit when you press three is like your uh, knuckles here. Four would be your knuckles here. And then five are your fingertips. So just to kind of give you like a rough idea of what it would be like when you're actually putting your hands on your animals. And again, the more you do, just the better you're going to get at it. So um, hopefully you're bringing your sheep and goats in for parasite control, like checks as well. So hopefully when you have your hands on them, you can be doing that. And sheep are, you know, it's really uh, the same kind of idea. Again, just the, the numbers are condensed, so it's, it's slightly different, but but still you're looking for that middle range. So maintenance two is fine, breeding three, which would, you know, be very equivalent to that beef cow, you know, five, six kind of number. Um, early gestation two or higher, late gestation three, lambing three, and weaning two. Um, again, just because they, they need all that energy for recovering after the lambing or kidding, then milking, and then uh, with our young animals, again, adding growth into that as well. Oh. So this is based on cattle and uh, this chart, but again, all the things are gonna be very, equivalent to our small ruminants as well. So on the left, we have thin, which is body condition one of four, and then the right is fat, eight through nine. And I won't really spend much time on fat because I, I don't see that very often. Uh, I feel like more likely the things that I see, uh, if there's an issue, they might be going towards the thinner side. And so the problems that we see are failure to cycle, failure to conceive, increased calving interval, increased days of estrus, decre decreased calf vigor. Um, and you know, I wanted to say too, the reason that I wanted to do this presentation this year was because I experienced all of this with my sheep this year. And I just know how really awful it was. I just had some family stuff that took a lot of time and I, I had 
fed all the sheep. You know, it's not like I didn't feed the sheep, but I didn't pay attention to bunk space, which I will go on and talk about in a minute. But I didn't pay attention to bunk space. And although there was feed there, the boss sheep, you know, the dominant sheep were kicking out all of the younger sheep. And so I had three or four lambs get really thin. And even this uh, mature sheep, who was just kind of a more submissive animal, get thin. There was feed, but they just weren't getting access to it often enough. And I didn't realize because I wasn't putting my hands on the sheep like I should have until spring when they were getting ready to lamb. And I was like, oh, shoot, now I've got like these three, four, five uh, really thin animals. And I saw, you know, just a ton of problems. And because they're grass fed, it took that much longer too to like get them back to where they needed to be. So that's why this was kind of important for me. I wanted to share kind of my failures really with you this, you know, to prevent hopefully other people from having that happen. I had um, the mature you that got thin. She uh, got ketosis. Uh, she just kind of went into a negative energy balance, got really blah. She lost one of her lambs. She had twins, lost one. I had a young lamb prolapse, just, again, I think she was just thin. She was undersized, tried to have this big lamb, you know, it was just thin. And then I had a mismothering, which I never have mismothering by the sheep. They're very, very good mothers. And I really think, I mean, I'm, I'm not a vet and I know Laura, you, you could, you know, maybe correct me on this, but I just feel like she was just under condition and like so small and couldn't take care of herself, let alone this lamb, you know? So um, it was just, yeah, not enough feeder space and they got kind of bullied away from from the like feed bunk kind of area. And um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of share those things because I've experienced all this and it's really, you know, had I just bought another feeder, had I, had I caught it quicker, bought another feeder, the cost of that feeder, like what I lost in productivity would easily have paid for any um, improvements that I should have made. So just from my own little, you know, experience. Um, Again, so the relationship of body condition score to beef cow performance and income. So if we see our cows are low uh, body condition, you know, at three body condition, which is very thin, she's only got a 43% pregnancy rate. And if I'm up to six uh, score body condition where I want to be 93%. So just a vast difference, calving interval, you know, if we're looking uh, maybe not as an extreme uh, of a cow is three, but we go to four, 381 days versus 364. The weaning weights, you know, they're very different. Um, average daily gain is quite different. And then if we look at the end here, probably what everyone's most concerned about, yearly income per cow, the very uh, right column, uh, we see that thin cow body condition score of three, or even body condition score of four is only making us $222 versus um, our body condition cow of six, who is making 356. Don't, these numbers, I think, I don't think I know, these numbers are old. Don't look at the numbers and say like, I would make $356, but they're more of a gauge for me that I wanted to show you that there's a big spread in potential income with keeping your cows nice and fat and small ruminants. I shouldn't say fat, but in good condition versus thin. Um, so don't, you know, think, oh, I'm gonna like limit feed and, uh, you know, pay less for feed when really what I need to be doing is making sure they're nice and, you know, uh, appropriately conditioned. Because, yeah, as you can see from here, again, not accurate 2020 numbers, but just to give you an idea of, of the differences if, if they're well conditioned. Uh, and this was just in, it's actually a couple months old Beef Producers Magazine, but you know how those things get uh, kind of piled up on your desk and I didn't get a chance to read it until this week. And it just felt really serendipitous to have it in, uh, to be right there for me to read when I was creating this presentation. Uh, they're talking about how diarrhea is deadly for calves. And in it, in the article, they say inadequate nutrition for the pregnant dam, particularly in the last third of gestation, as well as the calf's exposure to poor environmental conditions. You know, all of these things, they're increasing the result of scours outbreaks. Um, not meeting a pregnant, pregnant dam's energy and protein requirements will decrease the quality of the cow's colostrum. And again, true also for our small ruminants. So, um, there's just so many far reaching effects. I was just reading another thing this morning about how, um, you know, poor, uh, like a poor start for that animal will follow them through their whole lifetime. So again, if, if we can just try to find, um, you, you know, the time to evaluate forages body condition and all of that. And this is more Aaron's wheelhouse, but I wanted to just bring it up evaluating your forages. So if you have a forage test, you'll be able to decide a little better if you need a supplement and if so with what. 
some people I say test available before purchase because I know some people, you know, before they're going to buy their their load of hay for the year, they'll ask the maybe the hay uh, the hay grower, the, the farmer that you're buying it from, if, if they'll provide you a forage analysis, um, or maybe even if they're not willing to, like, would you mind if I went over and got an analysis before I spent the money? Um, I know Aaron talked about the drought, you know, so this year we may be in short supply. So it, it may be something to consider that you need to destock some of your lower quality animals rather than shorting others on feed, maybe rather than trying to stretch it, you know, are there some that should be called maybe the bottom animals in your herd? You know, should, should they go so you can really keep your other um, animals in a, a higher plane of nutrition? I had to put the fat goat on here because I feel like <laughs> of fat animals, that's the one I, I feel like I see the most are these fat little, fat little goats, um, which is fine. Uh, but, you know, so if, pretend I've evaluated my forages. I see that uh, I have some better than others. If I look at my animals and have the ability to, to separate them, I could then decide, you know, which forages go to which one. Um, my young and thin animals may require a more energy dense diet. And so when they're sorted into groups, I could either, you know, give them the better quality forage that I have, or maybe all my forage is, is pretty equivalent. Then if they're in a group, I could maybe supplement with grain or, uh, you know, a, a protein block or lick or, you know, something like that. And also I could save money by not overfeeding those that don't need it. You know, I don't need to keep, you know, feeding these, you know, something like this uh, grain when he probably really doesn't need it. So I won't be wasting my money. So not wasting money and then focusing on those guys that really could use the extra. Um, I also just wanted to mention the environment quick and I know I'm probably running out of time here, but anecdotally they say that, um, you should think of a 10% increase for each for wind, uh, mud, and like rain or precipitation um, in energy need or yeah, of energy need. So pretty quickly you see that providing some kind of like shelter or windbreak could be really important and helpful. Uh, so here there was a University of Minnesota study that found that beef cattle, their energy needs increased 3% for each degree that the wind chill is below 59 degrees. Um, and, and again, it increases more in wet conditions. So I'm not saying that your animals need to be in a barn at all, but if there's like a way to, you know, have uh, them behind a tree line or in a, in a valley or, um, you know, just some, something that could help that a little if they're in a drier area. If you know that one part of the farm is wet and one part's drier, you know, if you could feed them on a drier area, keep them in the dry, um, you know, on concrete, just something like that to try to avoid, if you can, the precipitation, the wind, and the cold. You know, they're they're, they're going to be fine. They don't need to be, you know, in a barn. But just as much as uh, protection as you can provide could decrease your feed uh, costs a little bit too. Uh, just briefly, I want to talk about feeder space. So again, like I said, I had feed out all the time for my sheep, but those older animals are just bullying the younger ones and I, I did not have enough feeder space and it really caused me uh, problems that I'm still like, just now I feel like kind of getting past, you know, and you can see that the lambs didn't grow as well this year from those animals that were that were struggling. I had problems I never had before just because they didn't have enough feeder space. So sheep and goats, ideally, you know, 12 to 18 inches. And again, this is going to vary, right? If I have a Shetland sheep versus like, you know, what's my friend got? I can't even think of the breed, but they're, they're like waist high, or I'm sorry, chest high, like they're crazy giant sheep. So these are rough numbers. Um, feeder calves, they say about 18 inches per cow and mature cows, 26, I'm sorry, 28 to 36. And this is when they're looking at like a bunk, like you see in this picture. Um, I did find different numbers for round bale feeders. They said one cow per foot of bale diameter. Uh, and I, I feel like that's just because of the way their, their bodies are when they're, you know, as they're eating. Um, and again, this is a, a something I would defer to Aaron on if you had more questions, but just, uh, you know, maybe deciding to put your, your feed in some type of feeder could be helpful to prevent waste. That said, you know, that, that waste could be the nutrients in your pasture and the difficulty of moving these brown bale feeders, you know, that I don't know that people are moving them often. And then, you know, you're, you're having a lot of animal impact right at that feeder. So, you know, I, I, uh, you know, be something to explore further. That said, there's less waste when, when it's in a rack or in a feeder or something like that. 
So something just to think about, you know, less waste, but then you're maybe getting different animal impact than you would if it was out. And again, I, we, uh, that's something maybe that we can talk about at, a, at another time. But just, you know, maybe thinking about how you could prevent some of the waste. And so I do something like this with the sheep. Um, I stole this off the Premier website, not that you have to go to Premier, but they sell these panels. I just get hog panels at um, Agway or, you know, Tractor Supply, and they work pretty well too, but it's another way that you can, with your small ruminants, uh, be feeding and not uh, wasting quite as much. And these, unlike the beef cow feeders that are going to be harder to move, these you can just pretty much move by hand. Um, the, the problem is, though, is animals with horns, make sure you don't use them because they can you know, get hurt or killed on them. And uh, again, here, uh, Premier in their sales thing here, they're saying not more than 40 to 50 use per feeder. Again, that's going to vary depending on your round bale. So my bales at home are you know, about seven, 800 pounds, but you know, there's bales up to 1200. So it's really, you can't say 40 to 50. It's going to be based on the, the size of that bale. And then um, earlier we talked about feeding the cows and just that rumen fill. And this will be the same for our small ruminants. So the cow on the left, you know, is a dairy cow. And so, um, and again, this is a little tougher now with it being winter or get, getting to winter, cows getting a coat. So it's not gonna be as easy to see. These guys are nice and slick, so it's easy. But uh, on the left side behind the ribs there, you'll see a triangle and the cow on the left, uh, you know, it's, oh, well, she's actually getting a procedure done, but but she was nice and thin and it had this triangle that I thought illustrated it well. So if you can, don't don't worry about the, the um, procedure that she's having, but you can see the triangle. And there you can see it's pretty pushed in and um, so her fill is not as good as the cow on the left. So if you're wondering like, oh, are my animals, you know, they're eating stockpile, are they eating enough? Are they getting enough feed at the bunk, blah, blah, blah. Are, you know, are they eating well? What I wanna see is this cow on the right. So she's got nice gut fill. It's nice and smooth. She's not sunken in like this one on the left. This one on the left, you see that triangle really pushed in. There's not a lot of fill there. The one on the right is nice and full, and you're not really even seeing that triangle because she's because she's so nice and full. So if you're wondering, you know how they're how they're eating, that's that's one indicator. You know, in addition to the whole picture of whether, you know, you're having that fat cover and you know you're hopefully feeling them or getting close and kind of looking at body condition in general. But this is one way to, as well to see like are they getting enough feed out there. And so just to recap, um, animals that are underweight have greatly reduced pregnancy rates, increased birthing intervals, lower daily gain of offspring, lower meat quality. And again, once they lose that intramuscular fat, it's really hard to recover. I don't, I don't think it is possible to recover that meat quality again, and just in general, greatly reduced yearly income. So it pays to feed them well. Um, body condition score of five or six for cattle, two or three for goats is important uh, for animal health, reproduction, productivity, and profits. And so I know uh, I went over my time, but please feel free to, uh, you know, uh, text me, call me, write to me at any point, And I would love to discuss any of this further or answer any questions. And I'll make sure to send out the body condition scoring handouts um, to Tove to send to you all in an in a email. All right. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Stop so that, sharing. Okay. So that is... I'll finish this up and okay um, so I'm going to talk um, briefly about um, mission and vision and goal setting and the importance of that for your farm business and let me see, I just want to get this out of there, get this. There we go. All right, so this is me and I am the farm business management educator with the Capital Area Agriculture and Horticulture team. And just gonna talk briefly about these topics, some vision planning, mission planning, goal setting, and then we'll finish up with some questions. Yeah, let me get this. All right, so I guess kind of the big, the big take home message that I, I want the farmers on the call to think about is, 
um, where's, where's your business going? And what is the vision for the future of your business? And the terms that I'll use are this. Um, I work with a lot of farmers in my, in my career. And what I've observed is a, a lot of times farmers are so busy working in the business, meaning they're just so busy doing chores and doing the daily activities, they really don't take time to plan where they want the business to go. And I, and I just kind of say this jokingly, um, you know, farmer, you know, farmers are sometimes have their head buried in so much work that they're kind of, they're just doing chores, they're getting outcomes, and then they kind of respond to what happens um, versus working. So kind of getting on out of the business. Um, so getting transitioning from in the business to stepping outside and doing some goal setting, measuring what you do through good record keeping and then directing the business. So the kind of the whole message here is if you can pick your head up from working and, and look and say, where are we going to be in five years, 10 years? Um, I asked a farmer the other day, what's this place going to look like in 30 years? And he said, well, that's a great question. I don't know that I can answer that now. So that, that's kind of the things that we want to think about. So uh, <laughs> get out of just doing stuff and start to direct the business. All right. Um, so vision planning is just a concept of where's the business going. It's a long-term concept. Um, where, the, where will the business be in the future? And emphasize the future and focus on what's important. I was just on a call with some, prior to this meeting, I was on a call with some um, New York FarmNet people and also New York Ag Mediation people. And, they, and we, we were talking about how important it is to have the key players and everybody agree the direction of where the business is going. And if everybody knows where the business is going, um, just like a team, we, we can, the planning process is better and, and we're motivated when times are tough, when it's below 30 below zero and we're working outside and things are really hard. We know that this, this is where we're going and it just helps unite the team. And with knowledge of the vision, um, managers and employees tend to facilitate a clear path forward. So just vision is, is crucial, to, crucial to success. And what does a vision include? Uh, deeply held values, honesty, integrity, uh, environmental stewardship. Asked about business size and scope. Um, Maybe breadth of products or services offered. What are you, what are you going to be doing? The farm that I was working with the other day, they're a commodity producer, and they recognize that in 30 years they're probably going to have to add some value to their products, one way or another. So, thinking about how do we make that transition? And just uh, what's included? Quality of products. Who are we going to sell to? Um, how, what's our workforce going to be made up? Are we going to have um, immigrant laborers? Are we going to hire local? And vision planning increases the chances of success. And it also improves satisfaction among family members. And family is uh, the most challenging group to work with, in my experience, and from the farmers that I talk to. So the vision is uh, becomes more concrete when we develop a mission statement and a mission statement is more specific. So a vision can be a five or a 10 year approach and get that out of there. And the mission is more specific, focuses on what, what you actually do. And we'll get to that. And the time to do vision planning is uh, when you have time you know, for, for crop farmers, it's maybe in the winter time when you have a, a down a downtime. Um, just think about a time when the, when the pressure's off or there's less pressure and you can get together and plan the vision. And meeting all family members' expectations may be a challenge. So the, again, gonna have to compromise and, and just getting the right people. And I just was talking about this with the FarmNet and New York State Ag Mediation getting the right people at the table. So if the owners aren't there or the person controlling the checkbook's not there, then you need to get them involved in the conversation. 
and visions should be written down and visible. I work with a farm in Albany County that has the, uh, the vision of their business right in the office. So if you go in, you can see it. Everybody sees it. Everybody knows where the business is going. All right, so the vision is kind of the umbrella and we wanna narrow that down to um, a mission and kind of funneling that mission down. Um, so from the mission down to the vision, um, obviously the vision of the mission gonna be very connected. Um, mission is much more focused on the present rather than the future and identifies the basic purpose of the business. And who are we, what do we do, why do we do it, who we serve, those are the big things. And so just some examples in the mission, what, what is done, you know, what do we do? Who do we do it for? How do we conduct ourselves? Reflects the, the strengths of the business. And you'll see there's obviously some, a lot of interconnection between the mission and the vision, but the vision is kind of intangible, long-term direction where you're heading. The mission is more tangible, uh, present moment. What, what are we doing today? And just some examples in these, um, I wrote these and the, probably could use some polishing, but um, vision statement and I'm just going to read this. In five years, the farm business will provide a breadth of value added merchandise offerings based in beef, lamb and pork products, while at the same time being recognized as a preferred place of employment, which provides the highest quality foods available. Managing owners and employees, the business are honestly pursuing these activities because their love for farming, passion for environment and desire to be viable members of the local business community. So this is a really good, well, it's, it's a good vision. Um, five years might be on the short side. We might stretch that out to 10, but where are we going? Um, where are we heading? And just from the beginning, I, I think you have to ask yourself, what do you want from your business? So if you're a livestock producer out there, do you, do you simply want your business to, to pay the taxes on the, on the real estate? Um, do you want the business to pay the taxes and the operating expenses? Do you want to draw a wage from the business? Do you have loans that the business should be paying or is outside income coming in? So you really got to think about what do you want the business to do? Do you want to draw some money for retirement from the business? Do you want the business to pay for college for children? So these are all good questions. Mission statement uh, tries to bring that vision down to the present. The mission of, and I, again, reading, not necessarily the best thing, but I'll just go through it quick. Uh, mission of ABC companies provide industry recognized highest quality grown beef and process. So what are we doing? We're providing industry recognized highest quality grown um, beef, lamb and pork products. And we're gonna sell them at a wholesale and retail level. That's what we do. Um, we're gonna be, um, profitable as a leader in the business community and do this environmentally and sustainably. So trying to take that vision and bringing it down to a, a present day statement. And yeah, so try not to get lost in the big picture of vision, planning and mission, uh, mission development. Um, kind of here's, if you think of this in a, as an umbrella, the vision is at the top, we funnel it down to the mission, and then we have goals, which will help us achieve our mission and vision, and we have an action plan. And, and again, just our big vision is up top, uh, we have the goals to help us achieve the vision and some action steps along the way. And it's very important to have time frames associated with our action steps. So kind of taking the big picture, breaking it down, and um, creating ways to achieve goals. So goals should be sp specific, meaning exactly uh, what you wanna do. Maybe a goal is to uh, transition your assets into a formal business entity from a sole proprietorship or partnership into an LLC, for example. And we want a measurable, that's obviously something that we can measure. Um, action oriented, we wanna make sure that we uh, have the, have the steps to achieve that, may, meaning maybe meeting with an attorney and getting the process underway and realistic, meaning um, can we do it? We can do it. And also time-based, setting a time frame for each one of those steps. Maybe 
within the next 30 days, call the attorney. Um, within the next 30 days, schedule a meeting with the attorney. And maybe you know, six months to a year, have the business transferred the assets from individual ownership into a business entity. So I guess, and I, we're right on time here, and, I, and I'll take questions, but in summation, I really want to encourage the farmers on the, on the call to try to get out of the make time to get out of the head down working in the business to step back and work on the business and chart the direction of the business. And yeah, so if you need any assistance with that, that's, that's what we do and be very pleased to, pleased to help. So, all right, Aaron and Ashley, I, I went through that pretty fast, but I think we're right on, we're right on the hour and I, I've been willing to take any questions from anybody that has them and, and we can go, go from there.